Hi, welcome back. We've been going through What is Philosophy by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. We're in chapter one titled What is a Concept? And over the last couple of videos, we've been looking at some of the aspects of concepts that they outline in this chapter. So far, we've looked at the components of concepts and the histories of concepts. The third aspect that I want to look at here is concepts and their connections to problems. Deleuze and Guattari tell us every concept is connected to a problem, and that without such a connection, the concept would have no meaning. That is to say, it would have no value. Out of all the statements that we've looked at so far in this book, this is the first time we see the authors make an axiological statement. That is, a statement having to do with the value of something. In this case, they're telling us something about the value of concepts. But by extension, they're also telling us something about the value of philosophy itself. After all, Deleuze and Guattari say, philosophy is the art of forming concepts. So if these concepts have value, then the art of forming them must be a valuable activity. In other words, philosophy matters because it produces something of value. This is so important because up to this point, the authors have been primarily concerned with describing and defining philosophy, telling us what philosophy is, what it isn't, what it does, what it doesn't do. These are all answers pertaining to the question of what philosophy is, which is a very important question to ask, but it's just the beginning. Now, by connecting philosophical concepts to problems, presumably problems that you or I could potentially face as we navigate this messy, confounding experience of being human, Deleuze and Guattari are moving beyond the question of what philosophy is, and they're beginning to talk to us about why philosophy matters. So some questions we'll want to ask as we go through this statement and unpack it. First, we'll want to know what exactly these problems are that Deleuze and Guattari are referring to. What kinds of problems are philosophers concerned with? What kinds of problems are concepts related to? We'll also want to know what exactly the nature of this relationship between concepts and problems really is. Notice how they don't actually tell us much about this relationship. They only assert that such a relationship exists. They tell us that concepts are connected to problems and that this connection gives the concept meaning, but they don't actually tell us specifically in what sense concepts and problems are connected to one another. That's something we'll want to look at as well. Finally, we'll also want to know what it is about this connection, what it is about this relationship between concepts and problems that gives concepts their meaning, value, or use. There are a number of problems that philosophers have occupied themselves with over the years. Very often, these problems can be formulated as questions, and some of the more basic questions uh, end up forming the basis for different branches of philosophy. For example, the question of what the right thing to do is. There's your ethics. Uh, the question of what is beauty, that gives us our aesthetics. Some philosophers want to know what knowledge is and how we know what we know. There's your epistemology. We've got our philosophical problems then. It must be these big questions that have occupied philosophers' thoughts for centuries. Philosophical problems, or the problems that concepts are connected to, are questions like these. That was kind of easy. A little too easy. But I'll take it. Moving on to the second question then, in what sense are concepts connected to problems? Well, maybe concepts are connected to problems insofar as concepts are answers to problems. Maybe a good meaningful concept in philosophy will have a good convincing answer to one of these big questions. If that's the case, then our job here today is uh, pretty straightforward. We just have to show all the answers to these questions. That'll give us our concepts that Deleuze and Guattari are talking about, and that'll give us an answer to the question of why uh, concepts are valuable. So yeah, we can knock this out of the park really quick. Um, what is the right thing to do? Well, that's easy. That's, well, hmm. Well, 
now that I think about it, that's not a very easy question to answer. There's been a lot of different answers to this question throughout the history of philosophy, um, many of which are mutually exclusive to one another. You've got your utilitarians and your deontologists and your virtue ethicists and, and so on and so forth. You've got your moral relativists. Um, maybe, maybe that's not a good question to start with. How about something easier? What is beauty? That's... Oh, no, I've got it. Huh. Hmm. The, the question of what beauty is, is, um, yeah, maybe that's too subjective. Maybe that's not a, that, maybe that's not even really a philosophical question. I know. The epistemology, the epistemological question, that's, that's got to be it, right? I mean, if philosophers know anything, it's got to be about knowledge. Philosophers have to have an answer for the question of how we know what we know, and it's... Wow. These are, these are uh, tougher questions to answer than, than you'd think. Because the fact of the matter is, there is a variety of answers to this question within epistemology. Um, that's kind of what epistemology is. It's disagreements about how to answer that question of what knowledge is. And then, of course, you have the skepticists who don't think we know anything. Huh. Seems like this wasn't as uh, open and shut as I might have thought. Maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Let's think back to one of the earliest videos in this series where we talked about contemplation. Right, Deleuze and Guattari were talking about Plato. They were saying that you have to have your concepts in place before you can contemplate them. And we, we all agreed, right, that that makes sense. But what have I done here? I've tried to do it backwards. I'm trying to contemplate before I have my concepts. Or I'm contemplating, but I'm missing where the concepts actually are. The right thing to do is a concept. Beauty is a concept. Knowledge is a concept. We'll talk a little bit about that because I think that's actually a good example. In epistemology, this is one of the great um, Conceptual values of epistemology is epistemologists have a very rich definition of knowledge, although none of them agree on it at all. But they all agree on certain components of the concept of knowledge. They all agree that knowledge is a justified true belief. What they all disagree on is what counts as justified, and that's why epistemology is a philosophical discipline and not a science, because there haven't been any, there's no one single answer to that question. What someone thinks justifies a true belief is what forms the basis of each school of epistemic philosophy. So these questions actually presuppose these concepts. So these concepts exist before the question is asked. And if that's the case, then these can't be our philosophical problems. We'll have to go a step further behind. We have to go even behind uh, the appearance or emergence of a concept, such as the right thing to do, such as beauty or knowledge. The problems that Deleuze and Guattari are talking about are those problems which give rise to concepts like these. The first thing we wanted to try and figure out was what Deleuze and Guattari meant by problems. It was tempting to think that they simply meant the questions philosophers might try to answer or solve, but we've now seen that that doesn't work. Questions like what is the right thing to do, what is beauty, what counts as knowledge, 
These are not what Deleuze and Guattari are referring to when they talk about concepts being connected to problems. Instead, they're talking about the problems which give rise to these questions in the first place. Certain problems give rise to concepts, which then form the basis of philosophical inquiry. So a philosopher might inquire into the essence or nature of the right thing, or beauty, or knowledge. But why? For what purpose? Why do philosophers create these concepts, and why do they inquire into the nature or essence of them? Well, I like to think back to Socrates, who we talked about in the video on consensus, where Deleuze and Guattari argue that philosophers are not supposed to be working towards consensus or agreement. And I looked at Socrates' whole project as possibly uh, a good reason to think maybe Deleuze and Guattari are onto something there. After all, much of what Socrates spent his time doing was going around poking holes in what other people thought about things like virtue, uh, truth, and so on. Or maybe it's not right to say that Socrates poked holes in people's thoughts. He kind of guided people to poke holes in their own theories, in their own uh, views, you know, through the Socratic method, through his, his questioning. So one thing I might want to ask is, well, why did Socrates do that? What was the point? I mean, did he just have nothing better to do with his time? One possible answer we might want to give is that Socrates went around asking people basically what things are, uh, such as what is virtue or piety. The reason he did this was precisely to expose uh, the inconsistencies, contradictions, ambiguities, and um, less than reliable sources uh, from which people derived their conceptions of something like virtue, of you know an idea of what is good or bad behavior to do. So maybe that's the reason Socrates did that, was to expose these inconsistencies, to show people that, look, you think you have an idea of virtue, but you actually don't have a very good idea of it at all. Maybe that's one reason why Socrates chose to spend his whole life doing that. One thing about Socrates is he was never satisfied with the first answer. And if we want to understand Socrates, and by extension philosophy, we might want to try and think like Socrates. Now, I can assure you Socrates would not be satisfied with my first answer here. There's, there's more to it than that. Okay, he wants to reveal people's inconsistent ways of thinking. He wants to expose the unreliable sources that people get their definitions from. Why? Why does Socrates care? And... Why should we care? There's a few ways I can answer this question. We'll start out with the short answers. Basically, the reason that having a concept of virtue matters is because whatever we conceive virtue to be is going to influence how we act in the world, how we act towards others. Since virtue, of course, is principally concerned with right action, correct behavior, and so on, that's going to implicate uh, others, as well as ourselves. Doing the right thing tends to make most people feel good, so having a good, coherent concept of virtue will not only influence how we act towards others in a positive way, but also ourselves. But I want to break this down for you a little bit more, so here's the, the longer answer to that question. What are some things we can say, some basic things we want to say about our existence as human beings? First of all, we live in the world. We live in a physical world, a world with objects, space. Um, we live in this world with other people. So if we were just brains in a jar, we wouldn't really be doing much acting. So our actions would be non-existent. If we lived in a physical world, but there weren't other people, if there was only one person in the world, then maybe philosophy wouldn't be very necessary. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we do live in a physical world, and we that world is populated by other people. As such, our actions affect others. We don't live in a vacuum. So we don't act in a vacuum either. 
Another thing about human beings is that our thoughts, at least to some extent, inform the way we act. And so by extension, the way that we think influences how we act towards others, which is to say that our thinking indirectly affects other people. Now, of course, the focus of this talk is philosophical problems, what problems give rise to philosophical concepts. The mere fact that our thinking affects other people, albeit indirectly, on its own doesn't really seem to pose much of a problem at all. And in theory, it wouldn't pose a problem, except for what? Why does this become a problem? Or why could this become a problem in some cases? So the way we think influences the way we act, and the way we act affects other people. So there's a connection between how we think and our impact on others in the world. What's the problem with that? Or what could be the problem? Well, the fact is, our thinking is not infallible. Quite often, our thinking is, to put it mildly, not the best it could be. Sometimes our concepts are not fully flushed out, and an incoherent concept is naturally going to lead to incoherent actions, which in turn can then negatively affect other people, and can also negatively affect ourselves and our own experiences. So if that's the case, then it looks like our situation is hopeless, unless of course there is a way to improve our thinking. Well, there's good news. Although I've been saying a lot of things about Socrates' project, uh, assuming certain negative things about people, that Socrates' work sort of implies that people are walking around with incoherent concepts in their minds, um, that people are not thinking the best they could. And you could say that all of philosophy really kind of depends on that, doesn't it? That's kind of what philosophy does. If it's creating concepts or refining concepts that already exist, then a philosopher's job is in part to help people improve their thinking. I think that's a very maybe overly simplified definition of philosophy, but an accurate one nonetheless. That, of course, assumes a kind of negative picture of people uh, because it kind of assumes that people are not, do not already have the best concepts they could in place and that philosophy is supposed to lead them to these better concepts, lead us to these better concepts. But contained therein is also a very positive statement about human beings. Socrates' project and philosophy in general also assumes that people are capable of refining or improving their ways of thinking. Otherwise, it would be pointless. Just as philosophy would be pointless if no one had any bad ideas, philosophy would also be pointless if people only had bad ideas, or only could have bad ideas. At the start of this video, I said that we should pay attention to the fact that Deleuze and Guattari don't tell us specifically what the nature of the connection between a concept and a problem is. They just say that concepts and problems are connected. And they say that this connection is what gives a concept its meaning, which I think we've probably been focusing more on that aspect, on how a problem gives a concept meaning. It seems like a concept would be meaningful if it, if it improves the way we act in the world, which it can do because our thinking does, at least to some extent, influence the way we act, which is something important, being that we are beings in a world with other people. But now I want to revisit that idea of what exactly is the nature of this connection. Notice that they don't say that a concept solves problems. Notice that they don't say that a concept creates problems. But also take note of the fact that throughout the course of this talk, We've seen examples from Socrates um, and from more broad discussions of philosophy that a philosopher can both create a concept and also knock a concept down. A lot of Socrates' philosophy involves knocking things down. In this way, we're starting to see what the nature of a concept's connection to problems is. 
it's, it's two ways. For Deleuze and Guattari, a philosophical concept can respond to a problem, such as the problem that emerges from the fact that we are beings in a world with other beings, and that our actions affect one another. And so we want to affect each other positively, so we want to have better thoughts, better concepts that inform our thinking, inform our actions. That's one problem that gives rise to the need for a concept of virtue. If I don't know what is virtuous and what is not, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do to avoid harming somebody. I don't know what to, be, what to do to avoid harming myself. I don't know what behavior to accept from others and what behavior to condemn. That's going to make life very complicated and probably very short. On the other hand, a philosopher can also be kind of an instigator. A philosopher can create problems or at the very least shine a very bright light on problems that already exist. That's a lot of what Socrates does. Socrates doesn't go around questioning people's beliefs just because he's a big jerk, just because he doesn't have anything better to do, just because he wants to humiliate people or annoy them. No, Socrates really cares about these concepts because he cares about people. At least I think he did. As such, when Socrates would go around questioning people's views, questioning their concepts, he was trying to point out the problems, the holes in their theory, the flaws in their thinking, the missing steps in their lines of reasoning, so that they could patch those uh, holes or flaws back together and arrive at a better concept, at a better argument, and, by extension, better actions in the world. But perhaps the most important point I want to leave you with is that what guides Socrates to search for a coherent concept of virtue is the same thing that guides Deleuze and Guattari to search for a coherent concept of philosophy the reason they ask what philosophy is, and the reason why they think it matters. This is the same for every philosopher and every concept that that philosopher cares about. The same reason Socrates cared about whether or not we have a coherent concept of virtue, the reason Rene Descartes wanted to know what we could know, the reason Roger Scruton wrote and spoke so extensively on the subject of beauty, and its apparent decline in modernity. The same reason Slavoj Žižek wants us all to read Lacan. The same reason that Harry G. Frankfurt wrote a whole book on the subject of bullshit. The same reason that Immanuel Kant wanted to find out if we could reconcile rationalism and empiricism. The reason Thomas Aquinas thought it was worthwhile to study Aristotle. The reason Jean-Paul Sartre thought it was worthwhile to observe and record the movements and mannerisms of Parisian cafe waiters. The reason Marianne Warren wanted to know what counts as a person, what makes a human being a person. The reason Martha Nussbaum cares about what we care about, cares about whether our concept of ethics also includes the fact that we are feeling beings, not just thinking and acting. And the reason that Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari care about what is philosophy? It's all the same reason. These concepts matter to these philosophers and to us, whether we might know it explicitly or not. Not all of these concepts are going to be as resonant to all of us. Uh, there are many concepts in philosophy that don't have much resonance for me, but have immense resonance for someone else, and vice versa. There are a lot of concepts in philosophy that I find really interesting that other people, including other philosophers, would find not that important. But it all comes down to the fact that these philosophers think these concepts have some meaning. Slavoj Žižek must think that Lacan's psychoanalytic theories and concepts have some relevance to us, um, and he although not in always a very clear way, tries to show how those concepts can be applied, often using film and pop culture as a way to try and explain it in a way that the rest of us can understand. The reason that Harry Frankfurt wrote on bullshit is because he cares about truth. 
He also wrote another book called On Truth. Roger Scruton obviously cares about beauty, otherwise he wouldn't have talked about it so much. Martha Nussbaum studied ancient Greek philosophy, studied ethics, and started to wonder, hmm, you know, there's a lot of talk about thinking, about intellectually arriving at what the right thing to do is, and, that, and that's all great and everything, but do all these guys seem to not realize that we're also emotional beings and that we're feeling beings? And why shouldn't that be factored into our conception of ethics? And I've always liked that. Thomas Aquinas, although he was a Christian, a theologian, thought it was very worthwhile to study the work of Aristotle, who he simply referred to as the philosopher in his own writings. Jean-Paul Sartre's observations of the cafe waiter in Paris later formed his idea of, or at the very least, he used it as an example in his book, Being in Nothingness, of a very important concept he had called bad faith, which maybe I'll do a video on one of these days. Rene Descartes, although he was maybe eccentric by our standards today in deciding that he's going to sit himself down and not get up until he removes all the untenable beliefs he has, his impulse is understandable. I mean, many of us have probably experienced a kind of crisis uh, where we don't know what we know, and we're not sure what we can know, what can we rely on. And that can be a very painful experience, but a, also a very um, enlightening one. And I think Rene Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy is an example of what happens when you work through that crisis and come out the other side. Although, of course, plenty of philosophers since then have spent their time trying to knock Descartes back down and convince him that he actually doesn't exist, but that's a story for another day. What do you think? What are some other concepts that you've heard other philosophers talk about? Maybe even non-philosophers. You know, philosophers are not the only people that deal in concepts. All human beings think conceptually, at least some of the time. Um, and other disciplines deal with concepts, psychology, sociology, theology, pretty much any ology is going to have concepts. Um, so whatever your area of interest is, um, or think about your own concepts that you might hold, you know, why do you hold them? And, and, and what, what has drawn you into wanting to know what philosophy is and, and what has drawn you to philosophical writing in the first place? I know for me, it had a lot to do with wanting to know how to live. You know, when I was younger, I had a very, a kind of a, a, a moment where I was a teenager and kind of realized, like, I'm not really sure what I'm doing here, like a lot of people go through when they're that age. And I started to turn to philosophy at the suggestion of a, of a classmate of mine. And that kind of opened up a whole new world to me. Um, I've since kind of changed what philosophy means to me over the years. But there's still that, that seed there that was planted when my friend gave me a copy of Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, and, uh, and I read philosophy, really, for the first time. This is, in my opinion, one of, if not the, most valuable insights to come out of the What is Philosophy book by Deleuze and Guattari. But it's also uh, an insight that Deleuze has expressed elsewhere in his career before writing What is Philosophy with Guattari. As such, there's quite a lot that I really wanted to dive into in this talk that just simply couldn't fit, but that I think is worth looking into more deeply. So rather than jump into the next and final aspect of concepts that I want to look at, that being the interrelation between concepts, I think another talk would be helpful on another side to this issue of concepts and problems. In what is philosophy, Deleuze and Guattari express it as concepts are connected to problems. But elsewhere in his career, in lectures, interviews, and other writings, Deleuze has a number of sometimes very colorful, sometimes a little shocking ways of expressing another aspect of this idea, namely that we do in fact need concepts. I think these two ideas are connected. If a concept is connected to a problem, that kind of implies that there's a need for a concept. Problem, need a solution. 
or need a response. Maybe solution is a little bit strong since, of course, we've seen that concepts don't always necessarily solve problems, at least not in the way that we typically use the word solve. For Deleuze and Guattari, of course, part of the way that philosophy quote-unquote solves problems sometimes is by creating new ones or instigating problems. But in any case, some of the other aspects of concepts and their connections to problems that I think are important to look at um, simply couldn't talk about here just because of time constraints. So in the next video, I want to start taking a look at some very interesting quotes that Deleuze had from outside of the book What is Philosophy uh, that I think will help in understanding where he and uh, Guattari are coming from uh, in their assertion that concepts and problems are connected and that this connection gives concepts their meaning. One of, but not the only, uh, little slogan that I like from Deleuze is from a 1980 lecture that he gave um, on the subject of Gottfried Leibniz, a philosopher who we'll be coming back to uh, later in this same chapter of what is philosophy. He's a, doing a lecture on Leibniz titled Philosophy and the Creation of Concepts. Seems like an appropriate title. And at one point he utters this very unusual, very interesting phrase. To need a concept is to have something to scream. It's so interesting and it's the kind of thing that really deserves a much more in-depth exploration. So I hope you'll join me for that, and I hope that you've been enjoying these talks so far, and um, hope you're well. Thanks.